Here we go. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Thanks for joining. Uh, sorry we're a little late. Uh, you know, sometimes we're running into a couple technical difficulties, but uh, we'll get those figured out as we continue to do this. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be able to offer an educational series uh, to all of our customers, anybody that's tuning in. Um, we love having you, so thank you for joining us. Today I'm talking about butterfly gardening, a really exciting topic. Um, I love all the different plants you can see. I've just got so much in front of me. i got a lot to talk about. A um, couple things to start with is questions. Please ask questions. Um, I will get to them at the end of the class, um, at the end of the seminar. Um, but um, if I can't get to all of them, then I'll try and get back to you and answer them as quickly as I possibly can. But thank you for joining. Talking about butterfly gardening, here at McDonald Garden Center, McDonald Garden Center has been in Hampton Roads for 75 years. We know this area very well. We have so many amazing experts. Our employees are just the best and a wealth of knowledge. I mean, where a lot of people ask me, where did you learn all this stuff? And, and I've learned it from them. They taught me. Um, so our employees are amazing people. Uh, they're so much fun to talk to and interact with. Um, and we're open and we want you to come in and talk to them and pick their brains. So come in and check us out if you want to. Uh, but this is a great way of just kind of talking about butterfly gardening. Maybe you already have one. Maybe you're looking to add a little bit to it. Maybe you don't have anything and you want to get started. This is going to be a basic class just to kind of talk about mainly the different types of plants, but also a couple different elements that maybe you don't know about um, and also kind of a little bit of design and things that you can do throughout the season. So, um, first what I want to do is talk about how, how much fun butterflies are to just observe and encourage into your yard. They're also very important to the environment. Uh, butterflies are great pollinators, along with bees and hummingbirds. Those are also going to be, I'll talk about them here and there in this, but mainly I'm going to specifically talk about butterflies. But butterflies um, are, great sort, are great pollinators. Uh, they help us. They help us produce food for ourselves. You've grown blueberries, blueberries. Butterflies are great pollinators of blueberries. So they help us with, with our food source. So they're vital to, to our survival, but they're also vital to the survival of a lot of other types of animals that eat plants or berries or nuts um, that come from these, uh, these, these plants that butterflies are helping pollinate. Uh, so they're very, very important as are hummingbirds and bees. And this is gonna attract almost all of them, but specifically again about hummingbird, uh, about butterflies. Um, so real quick, I'll touch on Hummingbirds and bees. I just want to talk about it real quick because they're super important and then we'll go right into all about basically butterflies. But hummingbirds are very easy to attract. There's lots of flowers and plants, uh, but you can also do a simple you know, hummingbird feeder with some nectar, really easy to do. Um, that will help attract some uh, hummingbirds, but then a lot of these plants are gonna do it as well. Think tubular flowers for hummingbirds. They really like those tubes. They love to fly around it. So something that's got like large spikes, that'll pop up and have those tubular flowers. We'll talk about some of those as we go through there. Bees are also a great pollinator and something that you want to encourage in your yard, especially if you're doing vegetable gardening. Uh, we've got a lot of different things that you can do. Um, you know, if you want to do an actual bee, you know, a, a, a honey bee hive, you can do that. Um, it is, you know, a fair amount of work. But if you want to do something easy, I love these little bee houses. These are for mason bees. Not carpenter bees, a lot of people get scared about carpenter bees, but mason bees are non-aggressive, solitary bees, great pollinators, um, and they love these little holes in these bamboo or wood holes. Uh, they're not gonna make holes in your house, so I know a lot of people get scared by the carpenter bees, and rightfully so, they can cause a lot of damage. But mason bees are super, super easy to encourage you into your yard using nectar plants, as well as your vegetables, and then these little bee houses are super, super easy to, to install. You can hang them off fences, you can put them in a shrub, but these are really easy, and we've got lots of different types and varieties. I love this one, this little honeycomb shape. So um, really cool, easy way to encourage those into your yard. But let's talk about butterflies specifically. So a couple topics. These are, this is kind of gonna, how I'm gonna kind of go through this class. Uh, we're gonna talk about location, where you can do it in your yard. Uh, choosing the right plants, obviously very important. We're going to talk about host plants and nectar plants. What's the difference? And then we're going to talk about other elements that you can inc include in a butterfly garden. There's a lot of other things that you didn't know that maybe you didn't know that, that butterfly gardens really need to help keep them in your yard. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about care and maintenance, how to care for everything, and then a little bit about design. And then I've got a kind of a little surprise at the end that'll be fun for kids and grandparents and adults of all ages. Uh, it's so much fun, so easy to do. 
um, and just a great topic and so much enjoyment throughout the entire year. So really, really excited topic to talk about. Uh, so let's talk about location. Uh, most of the plants that you see in front of me are going to be full sun plants. So you definitely want to try and find a spot that's got a lot of sun. I'll talk a little bit about shade. There are some plants that you can grow in the shade. It's a little bit trickier, uh, but if you've got a full sun spot, something that gets at least four to six hours of sunlight is what you want. Good sunlight. So if you get sun from sun up to about two o'clock, you're okay. You can still do this. If you get sun from noon on, you're perfect. If you get sun all day long, great. Um, but those are going to be the best ways to, to attract butterflies into your yard because you're going to get so many more blooming plants in a full sun environment. So really, really important. Um, then also, so that's kind of the difference between sun and shade. Now, if you're getting shade from noon on, then that's a shade area. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple different plants that you can do in there to at least encourage some maybe to come into your yard. Um, but um, determine the size of the area too. So you can do them in lots of different locations. Uh, you can do it, you can create a new bed, it can be a circular bed, we'll talk about that a little bit as we talk about the design elements. Um, it could be a brand new bed, it could be into your existing landscape design. We can even do them in containers, so we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So maybe you only have sun up on your deck or porch or patio, um, and great place to do a container butterfly garden. Very easy to do. Lots and lots of different possibilities, lots of different ways that you can do this. Um, so let's go right into, to, or First, let's talk about soil. So once you get your, your location uh, determined, all of your plants are gonna always do better if you invest a little bit in your soil. And what we mean there is our area typically has a very clay-based soil, sometimes sandy. Uh, but let us know what type of soil you have, and we can help you um, amend that soil with compost, perlite, vermiculite. Um, we're doing lots of these seminars. We just did one a couple weeks ago, or last week, on soil. Uh, it was a lot of talk about soil. Um, but great information in there. We've got notes. We're going to be doing notes for all these classes, so give us a few days to get our notes up. But um, soil is very important. So if you're going to create a new bed and you're going to kill the, the grass area, maybe it's just grass or weeds or whatever it might be, um, or maybe it's an old bed that you just haven't you've neglected or something, you're going to turn it into a butterfly garden. Look at the soil. Um, pH is important. You can bring in a, a soil sample. We do free pH tests. Um, but not the end-all be-all. Really what we want to do is encourage a rich environment for these plants to grow in. Because one of my favorite things as we start to talk about plants um, is a lot of these are perennials. Perennials are awesome. Perennials come back every year. So annuals, you got to plant every year. They're going to bloom the entire time you have them in the ground. Um, and then you're going to replace those in the fall with pansies or snapdragons or whatever it might be. Um, but perennials, while some of them will go dormant and die off, they come back. So perennials are super, super valuable. Great way of establishing a great butterfly garden. Um, and they're just so valuable because they come back every year. And then we've got trees and shrubs as well. So lots of different things you can do. Um, so let's talk about um, when, when you're starting to think about plants. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the design element as well. Um, but think about how big of an area you got and how big of a plant it's going to get. Some plants stay nice and small and compact. Some are going to get big. I mean, if we're talking about a crepe myrtle for, for a nectar plant, you know, crepe myrtles can get 20 to 30 feet high. So you gotta think about the size of the plants and how big it's gonna get and the type of maintenance that you're willing to do. You know, is it something that you want to be, you know, deadheading your, itself and, and not a lot of work, um, but if it's something that you enjoy, I mean, it's a great time to be out in the yard. Um, I love, it's therapeutic, stress relieving to go out and just deadhead some plants and be, spend some time outside in nature. It's a great time to be in the environment um, and a great time to do butterfly gardening. So think about that. Um, also, when again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the design, but think about when you're laying out your area, grouping plants together. Butterflies see a lot of color. So if you have a lot of different plants spread out all over the place, you'll attract some butterflies. But if you put three to five of those plants together in mass, mass plantings will definitely attract more butterflies uh, because you've got a lot more bloom capacity and you've got a lot more nectar there and they can see it. From high above, as they fly over, they'll see a huge, you know, pack of Coreopsis or Lantana, um, and they'll see that, and they'll come down, and they'll spend some time in your yard. So think about that as well. Um, and then always check out the bloom time. So bloom time, there's so many different types of, of flowers here. I don't even have a full range of it here. Uh, we don't even have a lot of it in stock because some of it's still coming in. It's a little early in the season. Great time to start planning and start thinking and start adding elements. But don't think that it's something, if you want to do it in one weekend, you definitely can. 
But if you want to spend some time and add some elements throughout the year, that is a great way of getting blooms throughout the entire spring, summer, into fall. Um, because a lot of things like asters, asters, a lot of people ask us for asters. Well, asters, we might get in some here and there, but typically, typically we're going to get those in the fall. That's when they're blooming. And that's not because that's how we necessarily want it, but a lot of growers, that's what growers do. Growers have different seasons that they're growing in. And so they're going to grow asters in the summer to help out garden centers in the fall provide blooming plants. And so typically you're going to find plants in our garden center that are blooming. Uh, and we're not going to have a lot of plants that necessarily aren't blooming. Um, so, so think about that too and think about coming in and seeing us now, again in the summer, and then again in the fall to kind of build your butterfly garden because you get a bigger selection if you come throughout the year and kind of think about those different elements. We can't always have every, every different type of plant. Uh, we have a great assortment right now, amazing selection as you can see in front of me, and I only grabbed maybe 20% of what I could have grabbed. There's so many different choices. So let's talk about nectar and host plants. What's the difference? Nectar plants are going to provide the food source for your butterflies. So they're providing the nectar. They're giving them the energy and they're giving them the, the need or the want to stay in your yard. So having nectar plants is super important. Um, it, it's really one of the best ways to encourage them into your yard. I mean, all of these different blooms, they're beautiful. So you get beautiful plants and you get beautiful butterflies flying in your yard. It's an amazing thing to see. So many different types of butterflies out there as well. Um, but nectar plants are really, really important, great way to add into your yard. And some people just do nectar plants, and that's great. You know, you're going to attract bees and butterflies and hummingbirds into your yard, and that's great. You're providing a food source for them. Now, host plants are different. Host plants are very specific, so we're going to get real specific when we talk about host plants. Um, they're specific to each butterfly, um, which that's a huge list. I can't go through all that detail. I'll talk about two or three of the most important ones in this area that most people want to attract, monarchs, swallowtails. So those are the ones that we're going to talk about specifically. But host plants are the plants that butterflies are going to lay their eggs on. The eggs are going to hatch. The caterpillar is going to come out. The life cycle is going to start and begin. It's going to be amazing. And then they're going to eat that plant up. And then they're going to form their chrysalid or the cocoon. It's called a chrysalid or a cocoon. Um, and then they're going to hatch into a butterfly. And you can see that whole process happen right there before your eyes in your butterfly garden. And that's what's so exciting about this and so much fun. And we're going to talk about a different way, a couple different ways that you can actually do that. Um, so that's the difference between nectar and host plants. So now we're going to get into a little bit of detail about our nectar plants. Lots and lots of choices. I like to start big and work my way down. So what I'm going to start with is trees and shrubs. Trees and shrubs, there's a pretty big assortment actually of trees and shrubs. And trees and shrubs are there all the time. So take this for example. This is a Rose of Sharon. So you can see this nice big shrub right here. Rose of Sharon are awesome. It's actually a type of hibiscus. Some people call it Althea, Rose of Sharon, or hibiscus. So lots of different names for this one, but it's actually a, a shrub. It's a deciduous shrub. It's going to drop its leaves. You can see it's just putting leaves out. Uh, but this is a great nectar plant. Uh, blooms all summer long with these gorgeous little hibiscus blooms, lots of different varieties. Uh, we're just getting some in. Again, another plant that you're going to see more as we get warmer because they're blooming at that point of the year. Uh, another really, really popular shrub, of course, is the butterfly bush. Lots and lots of different varieties nowadays. Love to have butterfly bushes in your butterfly garden uh, because it's going to have these big, long purple, pink, white, lots of different colors, uh, lots of different shades, lilacs, lots of different colors of blooms, and so many different sizes now, which is so cool. When I think, I think when I started probably about 17 years ago, there was like two or three different varieties, and they all got huge, and they got eight to 10 feet tall. Now we've got these really cool ones, like this one right here. It's called Pugster, and Pugster is a dwarf. It's these big leaves, humongous blooms. I mean, just amazingly big blooms um, on this small little compact plant. They don't get very big. So there's lots of different options for you. Um, so those are two really, really popular shrubs. Is there anything else that I grabbed? So here's another bu butterfly bush. You can see it just starting to bloom here, just starting to put out its buds. So again, another different variety that gets about four by four. Um, the Pugster only gets about two by two, three by three, so it's a really small little dwarf plant. Um, other shrubs that you can do, think of anything that's blooming. Azaleas, I did grab an azalea. Azaleas are great. They bloom in the spring. You see a lot of them blooming right now. This is an Encore Azalea. Encore Azalea is blooming in the spring, sporadically in the summer, and then again in the fall. So this is a great plant because it's going to provide blooms throughout the entire growing season. So if you've got azaleas in your yard, you probably are seeing butterflies on it. A uh, really, really good shrub to, to provide some nectar. Um, and then we've got, let me see what else is on my list. Uh, Wygelia, lilac, 
Sweet Spire, I mentioned great myrtles, red buds. So these are great nectar plants. Uh, great trees, shrubs, lots of different choices. Abelia, the list goes on and on. Like I said, I couldn't grab everything, but there's so many different choices if you want a evergreen plant that's gonna be in there. Abelia is awesome. It blooms in the summer with white flowers. Hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies love them. Uh, there's a gorgeous one called Kaleidoscope Abelia. So you can actually do trees and shrubs and, and incorporate them and make a very big uh, butterfly garden. Uh, or maybe you just want a tree as the centerpiece and you can do a small cray myrtle. Cray myrtles come in all different sizes as well. So lots and lots of choices in the trees and shrubs. Now, I'm gonna skip perennials because there's a ton of perennials that I wanna talk about. And I'm gonna go to annuals. Annuals, lots of different choices as well. And again, different ones throughout the season. Um, pintas, I think, are probably one of the most popular ones. Pintas are not in yet. It's a little early for pintas. You want to look for those around May 1st. Uh, that's typically when we'll get them in. We'll try and get them in a little bit earlier if we can. Um, but again, pintas are great. Zinnias are amazing. Let me show you these zinnias right here. I love this color. Zinnias we've got in packs right now. We've got in four packs. But zinnias are one of the best for nectar for, hum for uh, butterflies in this area. Dahlias, verbena, verbena is awesome. Look at that big red bloom, they love that color. So verbena is a really, really good annual. So if you're thinking hanging baskets, if you wanna do hanging baskets for some height, or maybe that's all the space you have is to do a hanging basket, verbena is a great one. Petunias are another good one. Petunias attract a lot of hummingbirds, so that's a good one. Kufia, great hummingbird attractor. Um, but there's a load of different types of annuals that you can do. Let's see if I missed any here on my list. Pintas, petunias, zinnias, lantana. I'm going to talk about lantana for perennials because I love this one. But this is an annual lantana. You can see it with the yellow blooms. Lots of different sizes in these. So when I talk about the perennial one, that one gets pretty big. But there's a lot of annual lantanas that stay small, some that are trailing, some that you know don't get really, really big or aggressive, and then some that do. Uh, but lantanas bloom all summer long. Super drought tolerant. Great nectar plant. You're going to see loads of butterflies and bees, uh, you know, all over these plants. They love them. They're super, super easy to grow. And they don't have a lot of issues either. Uh, very disease and insect resistant. Uh, so great plants as well. So lantana is one that I, that I did miss. Uh, what else is on my list? And then I mentioned dahlias. Dahlias are a great one too. Dahlias are really pretty. If you want some different colors, you've got pinks and yellows and purples and dahlias. And there's a lot of other ones. Uh, marigolds. Uh, but zinnias are really, really popular. Zinnias love the heat in this area, and so they're going to perform really well. Again, something that we're going to get in a little bit later. So lots of annuals to choose from. Now perennials. Perennials, again, kind of my favorite part of this, this conversation is perennials because there's so many different options, and perennials get so many different heights and bloom in so many different types of the year, and then they come back every year. And they're going to provide you with that value of knowing that, hey, this plant's going to come back each year and get bigger and bigger. And then maybe I can go split it and move it around. Um, but perennials are awesome. Uh, so many different choices. So I'll just run through a couple that I have here on the table, and then I'll check my list again and make sure I've touched them all. Um, but let's start up here with the front. This is Coreopsis. So many different color choices, too. I mean, you're going to see pinks and yellows and reds and purples. Uh, this is Coreopsis. This is a great one. This is an early season bloomer. We'll get the, the thread leaf one, Zagreb, and uh, there's a couple other different varieties uh, that bloom in the summer. They're also great. Some people might call them tick seed. Uh, but this is a great um, perennial plant. It comes back year after year. Um, great yellow color. Most of them are yellows. You're going to get a little bit of orange out there. There's a couple different varieties. But Coreopsis is a really, really good one. Then we've got Salvia, so lots and lots of salvia choices. A lot of salvias bloom here early in the spring. This is a gorgeous one with this pink kind of lilac bloom. Uh, but salvias are great nectar plants for butterflies. Really pretty plant, lots of different sizes in these too. So some that stay kind of, you know, about 12 to 18 inches and then some that get two to three feet tall. Uh, really, really pretty plant, lots and lots and lots of different varieties of salvia. Really, really popular. Veronica is another one that people kind of uh, mix up with salvia. Veronica is a great one. Veronica will be in uh, as we get a little bit warmer again. So that's something that, again, we don't have right now. But if you want a great summer bloomer, Veronica is a great one. Agastache. So Agastache is right here. Agastache is really pretty. Some people call it the hummingbird mint because it's got kind of a really pretty fragrance to its leaves. And the blooms are just amazing. Love the heat. They just never seem to stop blooming. Really, really easy to grow. Uh, hummingbirds love them because it's got that tubular flower. Um, the butterflies, bees, love this plant. Really easy, again, a couple different sizes, so you're going to get a little bit of height on this one, uh, but really, really pretty plant, Agastache. 
Um, and then cone flowers, of course, cone flowers, kind of one of the most important ones, I think, for a butterfly garden. Cone flowers are so easy to grow, so many different types. Uh, love the heat here. So again, something you're not going to get a huge selection of right now, but we have some in, um, and you can put them in the, into your butterfly garden, into your plants. Um, so lots of different colors, the purples, the reds. This one's this really pretty orangey red. There's orange, there's yellow, lots of different colors of cone flower. Cone flowers are a great one. Lots of different sizes in cone flower too. Some of them stay small, some of them, some of them get big. So again, always checking your sizes, lots of different varieties. Um, so check the size of the plant, what it says on the tag. That way you can kind of plan that way. And, uh, and I'll mention again, grouping plants together really, really helps kind of bring that impact in. Uh, you know, think of as you're driving down uh, past a hotel or a business, uh, landscapes are usually big landscapes, usually have lots of mass plantings, lots of plants planted together so that you can see them if you're driving 45 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour down the road. Uh, think of the same thing as a butterfly. When a butterfly is flying 100 feet over in the air or zooming through the yard, you can see how fast butterflies can fly. Same with hummingbirds and bees, they can move pretty quick. So to catch their eye, to get them attracted to your yard, plant things in mass so you get that big color. So three or five cone flowers planted in the big mass is gonna give you that impact that's gonna stop that butterfly in its tracks and say, come down, visit my yard, check out my butterfly garden, you might wanna stay for a while. All right, so then let's see, what else do I got here? Okay, my favorite, lantana. So this is Miss Huff lantana. Miss Huff is one of the best perennial lantanas, comes back year after year very easy to grow, uh, and these things get big. I mean, they can get three by three, four by four, five by five, they can get huge. You can prune them during mid-season if you need to keep it a little bit smaller. But these things don't stop blooming, it seems like. They're so versatile, so easy to grow. I think even if you're not gonna do a butterfly garden, I think you should have a Miss Huff lantana in your yard. Awesome, awesome plant. The one kind of advice that I give you is be patient with this one. Miss Huff lantana can take some time to come out of the ground. Be patient. Our soil takes some time to warm up. Once the soil temperature warms up, as soon as you start to see that little lantana poking out, then you know in a couple weeks it's gonna be huge. So lantana is a great one. Um, and you can cut them back. A lot of people wonder, the, the question is, is, should I cut them back in the winter? You know, because the leaves do fall off and you got this big woody kind of shrub sitting there, uh, bare shrub. Uh, you can cut them back. I definitely recommend mulching around the root system of, of this plant. Uh, because in the winter time to keep it nice and warm uh, and get it through the season. Some people believe leaving the, the dead branches on there helps protect it, and you can do that. If you've got it and you wanna keep it there, that's fine. If you wanna cut it off, we believe that's okay as well. Um, but lantana will come back basically from the base and grow again, just be patient. Sometimes it's May 15th, sometimes it's the end of May. It just depends on our mother nature on. And when our spring uh, kind of really gets reared up and we start to get those warmer temperatures and it warms up the soil. So be patient with lantana, but I definitely recommend it. It is awesome. As soon as that little pop comes up out of the ground, man, that thing's huge in a couple weeks, uh, and it just loves this area, and Miss Huff lantana does really, really well. Uh, bee balm, another really good one. Lots of different varieties now. You know, the Jacob Klein, uh, we, we carry that one. This is a new one called Great Gumball, so it's a little bit of a dwarf bee balm. doesn't get quite as big, um, but bee balm is a great one. blooms a lot. Uh, easy to grow. Joe pie weed is another one. We don't have it yet, but Joe pie weed, you're going to see a lot out there for butterfly gardening. A really good one. We'll carry that again as we start to get warmer. Uh, goldenrod, a lot of people ask for goldenrod. Again, blooms more towards the, the late summer into fall. That's when you're going to see that one. Yarrow, similar uh, uh, plants as well. So lots and lots of lists of plants. And again, I know this is a lot of information. There's a lot of plants and there's a lot that I'm going to miss. Um, so check out the notes at the end, come in and see us because there's so many different plants to talk about. Um, so I'm just kind of looking around the table, making sure I got some. So let me talk a little bit about, or here, let me check my list real quick and make sure I didn't miss anything super, super important. Um, so we mentioned bee balm, black eyed Susan, black eyed Susan is one of my favorites. I think I grabbed one. Here we go. Black eyed Susan's just coming out of the ground. This little leafy foliage here. So black eyed Susan is a really easy one to grow. Uh, forms a nice big mass. So again, that kind of, that attractor for the flying by uh, butterflies that, that to see your yard, black eyed Susans with that pretty yellow bloom with the black eye right in the center, great nectar plant for butterflies and hummingbirds um, and bees, or, or butterflies and bees really. Uh, but this is a great one, very easy to grow. 
loves our area. Uh, lots of different varieties. This is Goldstrom. This is kind of like the original. But this will form a nice big mass by itself. Really easy one. So I love Black Eyed Susan. Great for a natural kind of look. Um, all right. And then let's see. Did I miss anything else? Joe Pie Weed. We talked about Salvia, Agastache, lots of different types. There's also an annual Salvia. So I didn't show you that one, but this is a really pretty annual Salvia. I don't know if you can see that with that really pretty purple bloom. Bluish to purple, so there's even annual salvia. There's lots of different choices. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about shade. So a lot of us might be in a shady situation, but we still want to try and provide some nectar um, plants to our, our, our butterflies that are in our area. So there are a couple different options. Not a lot, but there are some. Hostas actually bloom in the summer, and they provide some nectar. There's columbine here, so you can see columbine, really easy plant to grow, loves the shade. Uh, and then we've got forget-me-nots, you can grow from seed, Virginia bluebells, uh, bleeding heart, a couple different options there, and heuchera, so coral bells or heuchera gets these really kind of cool wispy spikes. They provide some pollen, some nectar for, um, for our butterflies, so this plant loves the shade, blooms like this pretty consistently throughout the spring, summer, into fall. A lot of people grow this plant mainly for its foliage, amazing foliage, so many different choices in this plant. Uh, a lot of people don't like the bloom, so they pick them off. Um, I think they're kind of cool. So I leave them on there, and sometimes you'll catch a butterfly uh, in the shade, kind of catching a break from the heat on your heuchera or coral belts. So that's another good option. There's also a stilby. So a stilby, we just got some a stilby in. It's kind of spring bloomer. Looks kind of like a fern, but it gets these really cool shoots out of the top. Lots and lots of nectar in there, so you'll probably get some hummingbird or some butterflies stopping by some bees on your a stilby. So there's a couple um, shade options for you. So if you're working in a shade area and you want to try and attract some butterflies, I'm not going to say it's going to be the easiest thing. If you can find a space that has a little bit of sun, you're going to be able to attract so much more. But there are some options for a little bit of a shadier garden if you want to do a butterfly garden and attract some of those butterflies, bees, or hummingbirds. Uh, so we got a couple different options. But again, if you can get some of that midday sun, the choices become almost endless. There's so many blooming plants, so many perennials. So there are just so many great different ones there that you do. All right, let's talk about host plants. So we've talked a lot about nectar plants. There's a lot of different choices of nectar plants, uh, lots of different sizes and availabilities and different times of bloom seasons. Um, so lots and lots of different nectar plants. Host plants are what they're going to lay their eggs on. So not, mo <laughs> not the most amazing looking plants, but if you want to see the full life cycle in your yard, then you got to have host plants. you got to have the plants that the butterflies are going to lay their eggs on. So let's start with, of course, monarchs. Monarchs are one of the most popular ones in this area. They're great pollinators. They, they do that amazing migration, which is just so cool to see. But monarchs are really, really popular. A lot of people want to do that, and we're going we're gonna to talk at the end about a little thing that we, we got coming up this summer um, for monarchs. But monarchs need milkweed or butterfly weed. So just starting to get some in because guess what it looks like? It looks like this. <laughs> So you can see it's just popping out of the ground. This is swamp milkweed. We've got butterfly weed that we just got to look at that. So barely coming up out of the ground, but it's coming up. As the soil warms up more, these are going to get big. But milkweed comes in a lot of different varieties. Uh, most of the monarchs like them all. There's tropical milkweed that's an annual in this area. You've got to plant it every year. But swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, common milkweed, those are all going to come back year after year. It's a perennial. So really easy plant to grow. Uh, they do get different sizes. So like butterfly weed doesn't get quite that big. It gets about you know 15 to 18 inches high. So if you've got a smaller space, this is a great one. The swamp milkweed can get much bigger, you know, three, four feet high. Uh, so you might need some space for that and it does spread. So again, it's, it's gonna consume some space. So think about that as you kind of plan out your butterfly garden. Uh, common milkweed is another good one. We'll get that in as soon as we possibly can. But milkweed is a must if you want monarchs to come and lay their eggs. What's cool about milkweed is it actually blooms and it has nectar, so it's actually going to be kind of a both plant. It's going to be a nectar plant and a host plant, but monarchs will only lay on milkweed and butterfly weed, so you got to have those um, in order to allow the monarchs to lay their eggs. Uh, now, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more as we go on, but these plants are getting eaten up, so don't worry about that. It's okay. That's what they're there for. They're designed to get eaten by the monarchs, basically, and then they'll rebound from that. Um, so let's talk about swallowtails. So swallowtails, another native butterfly to this area, uh, really, really easy to attract because they like dill, parsley, and 
fennel. So dill, parsley, and fennel. I know dill and, and fennel look very similar, but fennel can actually get pretty large. Uh, parsley can get pretty good size too. And then dill. So you got lots of different choices here. Uh, a lot of people used to grow these herbs. I mean, we use them in, in our cooking, and they're great for cooking. Uh, and a lot of people used to come to us and say, something's eating all of my dill and fennel or parsley, and it was, it's the swallowtails. So um, it's a great thing to do. Most of the times I recommend growing two or three or four of these and grow some closer to your house, away from your butterfly garden, so that you can use them for your cooking. But then if you wanna grow some for host plants, these are great for swallowtails. Again, they're gonna lay their eggs on these, they're gonna hatch and they're gonna eat these things up. They're gonna love them. So these are great options for that as well. So dill, fennel, and parsley. And then there's a lot of other specifics. So zebra swallowtails, really kind of a little bit harder one to see. Uh, you don't see a lot of them out there. You'll get them in your, your nectar area typically, so you wanna look out for those and spot those. Uh, but the host plant is a pawpaw tree. It's a native tree, grows in wet woodland areas, um, so usually an understory tree, but you can grow them. We actually sell pawpaws. Pawpaw actually gets a fruit that you can eat, uh, but pawpaw trees are the host plant of the tiger, or sorry, the zebra swallowtail. Tiger swallowtails, um, their host plants are wild cherries, so black wild cherry and tulip poplars, and those are big trees. I mean, they're monsters, and we don't even actually sell them, uh, but they're naturally in our area anyways, so if you need, live near a wooded area, you probably have a couple of those trees in the area. So again, bringing them in your yard for the nectar uh, is a great way, and that's why we really love the regular swallowtails, the black swallowtails, and the monarchs, because you can see the entire life cycle happen in front of you because you have these host plants that you can grow and you can get your hands on very easily. Uh, you can grow them by seed as well. So we actually carry lots of different types of seed. We carry like you know, these little packets of hummingbird and butterfly mixes, uh, monarch mix, so that's got milkweed in it and some nectar plants. And then we've got these larger ones that you can just kind of throw down and spread over an area and get your butterfly garden. It's gonna be a little bit more of a wild kind of look. Uh, but again, so many different plants, so many different options. The possibilities really are endless as to what you can do. Um, so there's your host plants. Again, host plants are there so that you can see the whole life cycle. You don't have to do them, but we definitely encourage it if you want to see everything. If you want to see the, the butterflies come in, eat all the nectar and get all that energy, and then lay their eggs on your host plants, your milkweed. Don't forget your milkweed for your monarchs, and then dill, parsley, and fennel for your swallowtails. And they're very easy plants to grow, and they're gonna eat them up, and they're gonna kinda look a little gnarly, but then they're gonna kick right back when those, when those caterpillars are done and they form their chrysalis. Um, so let's talk about um, some other elements of a butterfly garden. Um, we've talked about plants, we've talked about soil. Uh, we definitely are gonna recommend mulching your, uh, gar your uh, butterfly garden, because mulching will help the plants perform better and do better. We wanna recommend fertilizing, so, We've got our McDonald green leaf or uh, organic fertilizer. So this is a great one. It's completely safe. You know, you don't have to worry about any chemicals. We'll talk about that a little bit on the maintenance side. But you want to fertilize your plants, treat the soil, and mulch because you're going to get so much more. You're going to be so much more successful with that kind of recipe. Um, and then picking out the right plants for the area, the right size, um, and let these plants just kind of grow and do their thing and then get out there for some therapy and, and deadhead and, and clean up a little bit every once in a while. But, um, but they, that, that's the best way to be successful, is to fertilize our organic fertilizer, mulch, you'll get nice big plants, keep them watered initially. So obviously all the basics with growing plants, we won't get into the details of that, but um, that's a great way of, of um, adding some different elements. So a couple other things that you can add is um, a safe place for them to hide. Uh, grasses are actually a great one. So this is sea oats right here. We just got in some sea oats, uh, but there's a lot of different types of grasses. I love that pinstemon uh, with that, that red leaf. That's an annual, so there's an annual grass. There's also little bunny. There's lots of different sizes of grasses. Pampas grass, it gets humongous. Um, so so many different types of grasses out there. Um, a lot of people love like Carly Rose is another good one, or um, the mooly grass, the pink mooly grass. Lots of people ask for pink mooly grass. So mooly grass is a great one. As the sun sets, you get to see this gorgeous pink bloom. Um, really, really pretty. And great little area for butterflies to hide in. Or you can have a home. So these are butterfly houses that you can mount to a stake, or you can put on a fence, or you can just place in the garden on a brick or something. These are great. These have these little slits here. So they feel really safe kind of walking in there and going in and, and kind of taking a breather. 
Um, are they going to live in here? No, that's not necessarily why butterfly houses are built. Um, but what they're there for is in a hot summer day, they need a cool place to go. And, and if they feel like there's a predator nearby and they can't get away, they know that they've got a place that they can go hide in. And these slits right here allow them to go in. So that's a great option as well. Something adds a different element to your yard. I mean, throw some statuary in there, maybe a bench for you to sit down and enjoy and the butterflies can come in and, and be playing all around. So think of those different elements. Uh, we've also got butterfly house kits. So I know kids stuck at home right now, this is a great little option. You can build your own butterfly house. So another good one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the bees are awesome, but you can get these houses now that have everything. I mean, it's got bees and it's got a butterfly on each side. So you can have a nice little pollinator uh, house here that you can get lots of bees and butterflies to come to. So we got lots of different options with, with that as well. Throw a shepherd's hook in there with a hummingbird feeder and you got everything that you need. Uh, they also need to drink water. So if it's a hot day or they just need water, if you don't have access, they don't have access to a stream or a ditch or any kind of water in the area, this is a great way. This is actually a butterfly bath. You can use a bird bath. You could use a clay saucer. So just a clay saucer with some rocks in there. But you can see this has this little kind of flower that's a little bit higher up than this. So you can just fill this with water. The butterflies can land here on this flower and then they can drink the water around it. So a great way of doing that, if you're doing it in a clay saucer, I love just taking a clay saucer, put some rock in there, maybe a couple chunky pieces, or maybe just some pea gravel, that way, and then fill some water, and then that way they know that they can land on it, but still get the water. Uh, bird bath, same thing. You can do a bird bath, just put a little bit of water in it, maybe a couple rocks here and there, somewhere for them to land and be able to drink the water. So they do need to drink water, so have a water source available for them too. If you're trying to attract the most amount of butterflies, you need to have everything there that they want. You've got a hiding place, you've got some water, and then you also might do like a flat stone, a stepping stone, something that's going to warm up that they can sunbathe on. So when it's a cooler day, they can go out there, you'll see them kind of lay down and spread out their wings because they're absorbing the sun and warming up. So a place for them to warm up, a place for them to drink, and a place for them to hide, whether it's a grass or a house, great elements to add to your butterfly garden, plus to add a different texture. So you've got lots of green plants and blooms and everything, uh, adding some kind of those hardscape looks uh, with a brick, a bird bath, a butterfly house, a shepherd's hook with a hanging basket, you know, add some verticality. There's lots and lots, lots of different options. So that kind of takes me to designing your butterfly garden. So how do you design a butterfly garden? Well, so many different options. Hard to talk about it all right now. Uh, that's a whole other class is, you know, doing landscape design or, or designing a specific flower bed. Uh, but butterfly gardens, there's a lot of examples out there that you can get on the internet. Um, but really what we want you to do is come on in, bring some pictures so that we can kind of see the area. If you can print them off, that's even better. Um, or just draw an overhead area of, of, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be an artist. We just want to know some dimensions. Check out your sun. Study your sun. Okay, I've got a sunny spot over here. I've got about four feet to play with. So I want to make a circular bed here. Maybe I want to make a kidney bean shaped bed. Uh, maybe I've got it in my landscape, but that area I can remove a couple plants or I've got a nice big open space already. I just haven't put anything there. Uh, lots of different design elements. Containers, you can do this in a container. So you can grow milkweed in one container as your host plant or dill or parsley or fennel. Um, and then in another one, you can grow some lantana, some annual lantana, cone flowers, and so many different things that you can grow in containers. You can make it all in one pot. You have space for one pot and you want to try to attract some butterflies. Then plant some lantana, put some parsley in there, and see what happens and see if you can get some, some butterflies attracted to the area. And you can add different elements. You can even add you know, a little butterfly house to the top of your kit, uh, to the top of your pot. So you got a couple different options there. Uh, design, again, takes some time. Think about it. If you draw an overhead drawing, a, a bird's eye view of the area that you want to do, bring that in, let us check it out with you. We can help design the area. You can also do it on your own. Just take some time, spend some time walking through the garden center and looking at different types of plants and looking at different types of blooms. Take some time to plan. Look on the internet. Read through these notes when we, when we get the notes posted from this class. All the different types of plants. So many different choices. We're not always going to have everything, as I mentioned before, but just know that. I know that you might have to substitute some things. I want a, a group of three purple blooming perennials that get 12 to 18 inches high know that information and we can help fill that, that for you. Uh, so that's what you typically want to do when you're designing a, a butterfly garden. Think about the different elements. Do you want an area for you to sit in? 
Do you want a place for a shepherd's hook? Do you want to put hanging baskets in the area? Do you want a hummingbird feeder? Do we want to do a butterfly house? Do we need to get stakes? Do we need to do any different things? So there's lots and lots of different options out there. Um, lots of different design elements. Um, you know, one of the best, I think, one of the most that people do is build it right into their existing landscape. So again, maybe you can move a couple plants. You know, okay, I've got, you know, a hedge here or I've got a couple different plants that are, that aren't, that are struggling and I want to move them to a different location so maybe they perform a little bit better. And now I've got a nice open space in my landscape that I can group the plants. You can do it throughout your entire landscape. So maybe you've got a big landscape. You know, backyards, most people will have backyards that are landscaped from the fence all the way around. Um, and you've got that big area to landscape. And you can include plants in big clumps throughout the yard. You know, again, dropping three or five Coreopsis together. You know, the, the lantana, that mass, you know, planting impact really draws the attention to the yard and they'll stay and fly from area to area throughout your yard um, and stay in your yard and then find those host plants that you have in there as well. Um, so lots of different elements. But I think a lot of people think butterfly garden, little round circle, kidney bean shape, we can help you do that. Draw it out, tell us how much space you need um, and how much space you have. Uh, you can also say, hey, I've got you know good soil, poor soil, I don't want to do a lot of maintenance. I don't mind getting out in the yard. I love to be out in the yard and I love to be picking with my plants and, and, hang, and hanging out. Think about all those different elements that you want. Um, it helps us help you design that, that garden. Uh, you can find garden designs on, online. Those are great too. Just know again that different plants in different areas. We know Hampton Roads. We know what plants are going to do the best here. So we might substitute a couple of those plants for you. If you've got something in there that we know is not going to perform well, then we're going to say, hey, how about this as an option? So don't get stuck in knowing that you got to get that specific plant because it might not be available in Hampton Roads. It might not be something that we're going to suggest because it doesn't perform well. Uh, so many different options. Again, perennials are amazing. They just keep rolling in. We keep getting different ones throughout the season. I love every, you know, every couple of weeks walking through the perennial section and seeing all the new things that have come in. So we wanted to encourage you to do the same thing uh, so that you can see all the different types of perennials that we have. Perennials are awesome. Annuals will get more and more in. So if you're thinking mandevilla and hibiscus and vinca and, and pintas, especially pintas when we're talking about butterfly garden, those are all coming. Just take some time. So we just want the soil to warm up. We want to make sure that it's a safe, uh, cool or a warmer temperature for you to plant in. Um, so that's why we're waiting on those things. Um, all right, so a quick little touch on care and maintenance. Most perennials are going to be wanting to be deadheaded. A um, couple options that you don't necessarily have to deadhead is like lantana. Miss Hall lantana is one of my favorites. Um, again, I'll kind of pull this up and show you. You don't have to do a lot of maintenance to this. Sometimes you'll get a lot of seed going on it, and you can just take some pruners and just kind of shear it back. You can take lopping shears. It doesn't really matter where you cut, just as long as you kind of take some of those seed pods off. It helps prevent the seed from producing. Um, it doesn't really produce the seed, it's, but that's why plants flower, is to produce a seed. So it thinks it's going to get there, and then it realizes it's a sterile seed and it doesn't do anything, it's going to die off, and then it's going to produce another bloom. Uh, but sometimes you can kind of kick that you know, out of that seed production mindset and get it back to blooming again just with a little light pruning. And that's what deadheading does too. So cone flowers, you know, once you get that kind of cone on there, that, that, uh, that prickly center, you can go in and pick them out, and that helps. Coreopsis, here's a great opportunity for you to see it. Coreopsis right there, you can see there's a couple ones in here that are just gone. You just go in with your fingers and just pinch them off. You can take a pair of pruners or scissors. And again, this is what gives me therapy, is just going through my garden and picking off these deadheads and these flowers. It's so much fun just to relax on a nice day and go out there and just work in my, in my butterfly garden, my vegetable garden, whatever garden you might be having. Um, so you definitely want a deadhead. Uh, fertilizing, I mentioned before, use an organic fertilizer. It's safe, you know, it's, it's, fail, it's fail safe too. So if you accidentally dump the whole container on a plant, you know you're not gonna kill the plant. Uh, but it's a lighter formula, it's organic, completely safe, pet friendly, all those good things. So if you got dogs or cats that love to kind of be in the garden with you, uh, this is a very, very safe one. Lots of different options out there as well. Spoma, of course, has great organic fertilizers, but organic fertilizers are gonna do great things for these plants, uh, and it's gonna help you be more successful and help produce more blooms, which is what we want to attract the butterflies. So use a fertilizer. Then a lot of people are gonna say, well, what about insect or disease issues? So first I'll start with insect issues. A great organic option is ladybugs. We just got our ladybugs in, so you can come and buy some ladybugs. If you've got a 
uh, butterfly garden going already, and you're starting to see maybe you got a little bit of aphid or mealybug or white fly action going on in your butterfly garden, you can just drop these around one of your bigger plants, drop them around the bottom. You want to wet down the area. So after a nice rain like we just had, or um, you just take out a hose and just kind of wet down that plant that you're going to put them under because it gives them something to drink right when they come out. Because otherwise, that's what they're going to do. They're, they're going to look for a water source fairly quickly and then a food source. So if you give them a little bit of those water droplets to find right off the bat, then they'll stay in there. You've got instructions right on the package, so it'll tell you all about this. But basically, you're just going to drop them underneath a plant. They're going to climb up. They're going to drink those water droplets, and then they're going to start searching for food. And, of course, this won't hurt the butterflies at all. A uh, great natural predator. Ladybugs are awesome. Kill lots of different types of insects. So butterflies or uh, ladybugs, another great insect that will help a beneficial insect that will help rid your butterfly garden of any kind of insect issue that you might have. So we've got those as well. And then, of course, there's Bee Safe. So this is a new one. This is Organicides Bee Safe. Um, it's a three-in-one garden spray, so it's completely safe. Again, use it with care. Be careful. I wouldn't spray your host plant, your, your plant that the, the eggs are on, uh, because it's going to act as a suffocant. But if you're spraying a plant that maybe isn't blooming at that certain time, if you get this on a bloom, it's not going to hurt the bees or the butterflies. But if you spray it on a host plant, so if I want to spray this on my milkweed, as those eggs are there, the caterpillars are there, you could harm those. So you want to be careful about what you're spraying. I love this little ready to use because it's really easy to get right to where I need to go. I've got an insect issue on this plant and I need to spray it or I've got some fungus forming and I need to spray it. I know that I'm safe to spray it because it's a nectar plant, it's not a host plant. So this is a very safe spray. It's a three in one. It's an or, uh, in insecticide, fungicide and miticide. So this is a great one, very safe. You can use it on lots of different things. You know, you can use it on your tomatoes and vegetables. You can use it on your indoor plants. So it's a great one just to have around uh, the, the yard, uh, to have in your garage, to use for anything. This is a really good one, very safe. It's the only one that's actually will not harm bees. It says it right there on the label. So you know that you won't harm the bees and the butterflies um, and any of those other beneficial insects. So use it carefully, but uh, definitely a good option. And just don't spray your host plants. You don't want to treat your host plants. What you really don't want to use are the systemic insecticides. Systemic insecticides are um, a product that we carry. We use it because it's important to be able to help certain plants, but you can use them at certain times of the year on specific plants. Again, in your butterfly garden, I'm not going to recommend it. So if you say, hey, I've got a butterfly garden, I've got an insect issue, I'm going to go to these two options, which is you know, ladybugs or the bee safe spray. Systemic insecticides are great for other plants that we grow because it goes into the system of the plant. However, unfortunately, it can go into the pollen as well and the nectar, and that's what the hummingbirds and the bees and the butterflies are after, and so we can harm those. So we got to be very careful about what we're spraying, when we're spraying. Also, bees and butterflies are out in the hottest part of the day, the middle part of the day. So if you spray in the morning or in the evening, then you're going to be a little bit safer as well because you won't be harming those bees and butterflies that are out feeding um, um, or laying eggs uh, in the middle part of the day. So be careful about what you spray and when you spray. So a good option uh, and safe. Just think about what you're doing. If you've got questions, ask us. That's what we're here for. So if you've got to give us a call, hey, I've got an insect issue and I've got, I've got the bee safe and I want to go out there and spray, should I spray this? Just ask us. We'll let you know if it's safe uh, and what to do and when to use it. Um, so that's kind of how you kind of do the care and maintenance side of a butterfly garden. Deadhead. Water initially, brand new plants need to be watered two to three, every, every two to three days for about two to three weeks to get them established. And then watch them in the summer. If your plants are wilting, go out there. Water deep, less often. You're always going to hear me say that. Water deep and less often. So you want to really give it a lot of water and then let it dry out. And that drying out time frame, that's when the roots are going to search for water and that's going to help you establish a plant a little bit quicker. Giving it a little spray on the foliage is bad because you can you can increase the chances of fungus um, and mildew setting into your plants, but um, watering the root system, got to do the, the root system, don't water the leaves, um, and then do a deeper water. If you just go out there and, and water the root system for a quick second, you got to do that every day, and then eventually you miss a day, the plants aren't going to make it because they're used to getting their water every day. So, um, so know that and, and, and water your garden. Mulch is super, super important. Keep the weeds out, um, and then also keep your plants healthy. Fertilize deadhead, add some different elements, think about the size of the plant, think about how big it's going to get, let us help you design your, your, your bed. Uh, again, so many different options out there, so it's hard to touch on all of them, but I hope I went through some specific plants that I know that I have in right now, 
We got more coming in throughout the year. I definitely encourage that. Uh, if you want to do it, if you're a weekend warrior and you want to do it this weekend, uh, we'll help you do that. Come on in. We'll get you set up. We'll get you everything you need to start a butterfly garden. Not a problem. If you want to take some time, it's great because you can get those bloom seasons throughout the entire year of plants that are going to bloom spring and then in the summer and then in the fall. We can help you with all those different things. Think about it. Plan it out. Spend some time planning. Um, you know, that's probably the most important thing I can say whenever you're starting any kind of new flower bed, landscape design. Spend some time planning. Uh, it really does help. It helps us help you, uh, but it also helps you kind of be at ease so when you come in, you're not overwhelmed. Well, I know that I need to get these plants. These are the ones that I need. If you don't have them, um, I'm willing to take substitution or I'm willing to wait. Uh, you know, it might take a month for us to get a certain type of plant in that, that you need um, or another substitute that, that we know we're going to get in the future uh, because we know that's when it's going to be blooming. So again, so many different options. I've got one more thing that I want to show you uh, because as we get into uh, the June time frame, May and June, as we start to warm up a little bit more, we'll actually be able to start doing our, our uh, monarch and caterpillar kits. So these are great butterfly kits. This is a habitat right here. Really cool. Pops open. So you can store it away very easily. But this just pops open. It's got this really cool vinyl side so you can see inside it. And it's got this door right here that unzips so you can get inside. Uh, but this is a great little habitat where, you know, the kids can get out in the yard and catch butterflies and put them in here and observe them for, for a day then release them. Um, a lot of people um, uh, don't, don't recommend it. That's fine. Uh, but these are very safe, very soft, very easy to use. Um, and a great little habitat for butterflies. And we do a kit um, in the summertime, so as we get closer and closer to National Pollinator Week, uh, we'll be doing our Butterfly Week, and that's where we'll get, we'll, we have uh, one of our local experts um, in bees and butterflies. Uh, she'll be providing us with monarch caterpillars and eggs, um, and this we have a great kit where you get a milkweed, butterfly weed plant to put in here, and then you get a couple eggs, and those will hatch or a couple caterpillars and they'll start to eat that milkweed and you get to see the whole life cycle happen right here. All you got to do is put this in a, a sunny to slightly shady place somewhere where it gets a little bit of both so you know they got a little bit of reprieve from that summer hot day. Uh, but we'll explain this kit completely but basically that, that caterpillar is going to hatch or the caterpillar is already going to be there. It's going to eat up that plant. It's going to crawl up the side when it gets big enough. It's going to lay its It's going to form its chrysalid on the top mesh so and then the monarch's going to hash it hatch and you can release it. So it's a great way of seeing the entire life cycle. Uh, another option is just to get one of these habitats. When you start to get milkweed and it has, and you've got milkweed in your butterfly garden, it's a great way, or dill or fennel, then you can bring those eggs in, one or two, um, and put some milkweed cuttings into a glass of water. And you can have those and you can change them out with more and more if you need to. Um, and you can watch the whole life cycle happen here. And then you can release your butterfly. Uh, so you can do that with dill and fennel with your swallowtails or parsley, or you can do it with milkweed. So if you just get a habitat, it's a great way of being able to observe that entire life cycle right there. But we'll also be selling this as a kit. It's an amazing kit. Uh, we'll have them once we know that we've got the eggs and the butterflies. So, so be patient. We don't know when that'll be. Again, it's a lot up to Mother Nature. Uh, and again, up to our, our amazing person that, uh, that helps support us with this. Um, she's so knowledgeable. And we'll be doing, uh, you know, during Pollinator Week, National Pollinator Week, we'll be having a big, uh, you know, week long uh, where we'll be doing seminars and we'll be talking about these kids. And hopefully we'll have our butterfly tent again. We've been doing it here at the Independence location uh, for a few years. But great, great uh, kit here that we'll be having. But we have the habitats now. So we have these at both of our year-round locations. So if you want to do a habitat and you're planning on planting in a butterfly garden, just pick up one of these. It's a great little thing to have because then you can bring it in. You know, if you've got the grandkids coming over or you want to do it with your kids or you just want to do it for yourself because it's so much fun, uh, great little option. You can cut off, put it in a glass of water, the milkweed, and watch the whole life cycle happen right there and just keep feeding them milkweed until it gets big enough. And then you form the chrysalid, hangs right on the top of the mesh, really easy to do. So this is a really cool option. We have these as well. Um, so we've got a lot of different things to choose from. I know that's a lot of information. We'll post our notes to get them out there uh, so that you can keep, uh, keep up with that. Again, plan, think about it, design your bed, help us with some dimensions, length, width, sunlight, think about the sun, think about the soil, think about the butterflies and all the different types of plants that you want to grow. Think about where you're going to do it. Uh, come in and ask us questions. That's what we want. Uh, have a little bit of planning done so that you're not overwhelmed. 
uh, and then we can help you come together with a, a great plan uh, right then and there um, and get you going and get you moving forward on an amazing butterfly garden. It's so much fun. There's so many different options. I mean, again, I can talk about this for probably six hours. I know most of y'all are like, all right, stop, stop, stop. Uh, so much information, uh, lots and lots of different options out there. Uh, and we're going to be talking about it all the way into midsummer. So there's just so many different things, so many different plants, different times. Uh, but think about your butterflies. Think about your pollinators. It's a great thing to do for our environment. It helps us out. It helps them out. Uh, and it helps out lots of different animals. Without pollinators, I don't know where we'd be. So let's save our pollinators um, and help them by providing some nectar plants, maybe some host plants if you want to. Lots of different options. So now I'll come over there. I'll answer your questions as many as I possibly can. And then thank you again for joining us. If you don't have any questions, you don't want to listen to the questions, thanks for joining us. We'll keep on doing this. Friday, we've got Birding 101. So if you want to watch a birding seminar, uh, we'll be doing that Friday. And then we'll continue next week with a few more. We'll keep on doing this. Uh, thanks for being patient with us. And, and thanks for supporting our uh, this local garden center. I've been in Hampton Roads for 75 years. A lot of these plants you can get at both of our year-round locations. We've got garden markets across Hampton Roads. Uh, so great places to go and check out. If they don't carry as, the, as big of a selection as Independence does or as Great Neck does, um, but they're great garden markets, you know, very easy to pop in and see, and they have a lot of perennials and annuals. So now I'll come over and answer your questions. All right, let's see what we got here. Let me tilt this back. All right, let's see. I, hi, I planted azaleas, tea roses, and gladiolus in my flower garden. What would be great for dense flowering ground cover that does well in sandy soil to prevent weeds? Great question. There's a lot of different ones. Uh, I go to sedums immediately. Uh, sedums and succulents actually flower and the bees love them. Uh, there's lots of different options there, uh, lots of different colors and types. Some that are evergreen that stay there year round, uh, like Autumn Joy is one of my favorites, sedum. Um, it's a little bit of a bigger one, but then there's uh, some low growing ones that are very easy to grow and they bloom and they would love that kind of sandy soil because they're like desert plants. So they're going to be used to a very well-drained soil. Um, and there's probably a couple different options. You said it was a uh, dense flowering ground that does well on sandy soil. So yeah, sandy soil, I mean, as long as it doesn't have a lot of shade, then I think I'd go straight for sedums. That would be kind of uh, my recommendation is a ground cover sedum succulent that's going to cover that ground. And then it's actually going to bloom and provide some, some nectar to the bees. Um, all right, what's the next question? I have larkspur seed. Where should they be planted? Sun or shade? Uh, larkspur seed, I, I would have to look. I don't know it by that name. Um, so I would have to look that one up. I don't want to give you the wrong advice. Um, there's a lot of different names for a lot of different plants. Uh, so Janine, I'll try, or Jeannie, I'll try and get back to you on that. Um, Larkspur, trying to kind of pick my brain. I think I know it's that tall spiky one. That's a full sun plant. Um, I'll check on that to make sure I'm right. But Larkspur, I believe, gets that tall spire bloom. Uh, you can grow from seed very easily. But yes, it would like sun. Um, if I'm thinking correctly, I'm trying to remember all my plants in my head. Um, but Larkspur, I believe sun, but I'll check on that and make sure. Um, I can never seem to keep a coneflower alive. I have mostly full sun. Okay, so coneflowers um, don't have a lot of issues. Um, they do need to be cleaned. It does help them to, to be clean. They do, takes a lot of energy for them to force those, to, to make those big blooms, um, to make those gorgeous blooms. So maybe fertilizer might help. Um, they can get some black spot fungus on the leaves. So sometimes that'll happen, especially with our humidity here. It's kind of that sticky, fuzzy leaf. So that can sometimes happen with our, hu our humid summers. So Joanna, you might try the Bee Safe. That's a fungicide that you can spray on there. You can go through and do that because um, you know it's a safe plant to spray because it's not a host plant. Um, and, and if you spray that with that, that uh, Bee Safe uh, uh, insecticide, fungicide, miticide, then that might help as a preventative. Again, I always tell people, better to be preventative than curative. So if you've had problems with them, if it's the same coneflower and it seems to keep struggling uh, or you want to plant them again, uh, try that as a, as a way of being preventative rather than curative. Uh, but mulch, fertilize, don't water the leaves. If you've got an irrigation system that maybe is hitting the leaves, going over the entire garden, it's better to have a drip irrigation system or to just hand water uh, and let it get acclimated. But those would be my recommendations is mulch, fertilize, and be preventative rather than curative. Um, Barb, thanks. Uh, Rena, enjoying the webinar. Lots of information. Good. Thank you. So much great information. Can't wait to get started. And 
So then she said, so Ruth said, yes, Mike, full sun. So I guess I was right um, about the uh, Larkspur seed, I hope. Um, or maybe, let me see if that was Ruth. Was she asking about, let's see, I'm not sure what that was in regards to. Maybe it was the Larkspur. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that one, but uh, something that I haven't grown in a while. So I'm trying to remember all my plans, but uh, Larkspur, I believe is full sun. Uh, great questions. Seed them for ground cover. Lots of different options. Uh, you know, let these plants grow together and uh, be happy. And, and butterfly gardening is an amazing release of stress uh, to be able to provide for our local pollinators. Um, so thank you for joining. Thank you for coming and, and, and joining this webinar. We're going to continue to do these. We want to keep educating you. Uh, we know you've got some time to sit around and watch an hour long video of me talking about this. I know there's a lot of information. We'll provide the notes. We'll keep doing this. We're here for you. So come in and check us out. McDonald Garden Center, Mike Westfall. Have a great day. Thanks for joining.